Okay, let's start. So, uh, welcome. This is the uh, CFA 2024 Level 2 Demo Lecture. My name is Jonathan Lau. I am the uh, English trainer at Kaplan. I train Level 1 and Level 2 in English, and I've been doing that for Kaplan for the last um, six, seven, about seven, eight years now, seven, eight years. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, I was... Uh, in asset management for a company called Brooks McDonald, where I was head of research um, covering um, fund management, asset management, um, asset allocation, these kinds of things. Uh, before that, I worked at Deutsche Bank in their corporate finance team. And um, before that, I worked at a company uh, called um, IFG, and uh, they were a pensions um, asset manager as well. Um, but happy to go through my, my background um, in more detail if you have any questions. Okay, so today, uh, here is our agenda. Uh, we will run through uh, level two uh, overview, what's in the level two exam, what are the changes. Uh, it has evolved, the CFA program has changes every year and it has changed uh, slightly more this year, as we'll go into. And then after that, uh, we'll do a demo lecture in alternatives, and we will cover private equity. Okay, so the level two exam, uh, here are the weightings. Um, you can see there are 10 topics as usual. Um, level one uh, and level two and level three all have the same 10 topics. Um, level two has um, the big changes for level one to level two is uh, vignettes. Okay, so with level two, um, you no longer have uh, questions uh, for 90 seconds like in level one. Um, in level two, you have uh, vignettes. Okay, so each uh, question set will be uh, one and a half slides of information. And then uh, you have multiple choice questions to, um, to do that. And you'll have between four uh, and six multiple choice questions. And I think most of the time now, um, they will do four multiple choice questions for, for the uh, item sets. Okay, so a lot more data, a lot more information in level two. Okay, so you have uh, your big topic weights. As usual, ethics makes up a, uh, makes up, makes up a big uh, section. Uh, financial statement analysis, which is accounting, um, is also an important part of level two. So, of course, you'll want to spend more time in these uh, more important areas. Uh, fixed income and equities also are, are particularly important areas, um, as you can see. Okay, so what's different, again, with level one and level two is um, you know... These 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 uh, these topics are a lot um, smaller, but you can't simply just leave them out. Of course, okay. So, uh, with a ten percent weight, uh, corporate issuers, it could be five percent, in which case you potentially could leave it out. Uh, but given that it's ten percent, if it comes up and the exam is ten percent, then of course um, that's a lot to give up. Okay, so you really do have to uh, tackle all ten areas uh, when you are studying for your level two exam. As usual. Um, the CFA is all about coverage. Okay, so um, the computer-based part of this exam. Okay, it's been like this for the last uh, three or so years. Okay, so now uh, level one, you can take level one uh, four times. Okay, and level two three times, and level two, three two times. Okay, and it seems like um, they have settled on this uh, sort of system uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay, so here, if you're listening to this uh, seminar, then uh, level two, we are thinking about doing the May uh, level two exam, okay, which is uh, in six months' time. Okay, now importantly, you cannot take uh, adjacent exam windows. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? That means if you take the May exam, and unfortunately uh, you don't pass, you cannot simply uh, resit it uh, in May, okay? Because uh, this would be an adjacent exam window, okay? So really, it's the the six month interval that they're, they're stressing here. So if unfortunately you fail the May exam, 
uh, you can take it again, of course, uh, and you can take it again in November uh, 2024. Okay, so that's um, something to think about. Okay, as it says over here, actually. Okay, so if we do the level two May exam and we pass it, fantastic, hooray, then we can move on to level three. Uh, we've done it in May, fantastic. Uh, then we can do it, the next would be level three in February. Okay, excellent. So you pass it and we'll do level three in February 2025. And then we, uh, we can get the charter as long as we have our required um, number of years of investment uh, experience. Okay, so, um, so as it says here, if we fail level two in May 2024, uh, the next time we can take it is in uh, November 2024. Okay, so uh, just to recap here, um, there are now also a limited number of uh, attempts that you can take each level. Okay, so you do need to take, uh, you can only p fail um, six times each level, which is a lot of times to be frank. So um, if you are uh, uh, unfortunate and you do try that many times, then you will unfortunately not be able to, to pass. But, um, but I think that's a, a fairly uh, high number of attempts that you're allowed. Okay, what else? Um, no time limit for completing the program. Okay, so you could pass um, level two in May 2024, and then you could wait a couple of years and then do level three in 2027, and that's fine. Um, and no time limit for passing uh, specific levels as well. Okay, so if you are really, um, if you really try a lot, a lot of times, if you try very persistently, then you will. I believe, uh, be able to pass the CFA um, exams. Okay, now, uh, what is the exam format? I did allude to this earlier. Okay, so the exam format for level two is they are still all multiple choice questions, A, B, C. Um, pass papers are unavailable. Okay, so that's something that we'll need to address. We do need, you know, that is a, a very useful and important uh, step in your um, path to uh, getting the, uh, the, the, the to pass the exam. Okay, so we do think about that. Um, now, the exam itself is two, two, uh, two hour and uh, two hour and uh, 12 minute exams. Each, uh, each session, each exam has 44 uh, multiple choice uh, questions. Okay, in vignette format. Okay, so what does this mean? Again, tends to be that there'll be a side, maybe a side and a half of some charts or some data, okay? And then uh, most, of the, most of the vignettes will be four question sets, okay? So four question sets on the, on the topic, okay? So it could be in, in equities, could be in financial statement analysis, okay? It tends to be that they specify one reading, in fact. They usually concentrate the questions on one reading, but not always. And there's, uh, there's 44 questions, so potentially there'll be um, 11 of these um, multiple choice uh, vignettes. Okay, and that'll make your 44 questions. Okay, and you'll have two exams. Okay, so that's how the level two format is. Which means you have half the number of questions compared to level one. Okay, so um, there are, there's more time. You do have more time in level two than level one. Um, but of course the questions are more tricky, okay? You've got much more information, much more data to, to run through. Okay, and we've got something else here new for this year is candidates must complete at least one practical skills module at each level in order to receive the exam results. Okay, this is something new for the CFA this year, okay? So the CFA institutes, they have uh, reflected upon um, advice and uh, comments given by the industry and uh, they're trying to make um, the CFA a bit more practical, okay? So uh, what they've done is come up with some practical skills modules that you need to do um, in order to receive the exam results. Okay, we've got a little bit more about that over here. Why don't I skip across that first? Okay, so practical skills modules, that begins in the May 2024 exam. Okay, what is it? It gives you a choice, okay? You have a choice in level two for doing Python programming fundamentals, um, analyst skills, or something called Python data science 
and AI. So I believe there are three choices for your practical skills modules. Okay, so depending on what your skill set is, and uh, and what you want to what you want to learn. Okay, you can choose between between these. Okay, so uh, what is it? As I understand it, uh, the CFA Institute have um, have said that it's um, videos and some short quizzes that you do online. They should take around 15 or so hours to complete. And all you have to do is, is go through that, complete it. There's no pass and fail. Okay, I believe there might be some way of them knowing that you have actually completed the, these video online courses. And then you can get your, your results. Okay, so that's, um, that's something new to this, to this year. Okay, so you need to complete that practical skills module in order to receive your exam results. Now, if you've done the exam and you haven't uh, finished the practical skills module yet, then uh, they, will, they will notify you of this and they will, you'll be given an extension. So although your exam result may be available to you, you're not able to get it until you've done that practical skills module. Okay, so uh, maybe they give you a three-month extension, you complete that uh, practical skills module, you, you let them know, and then they will give you your exam results, okay, is the way that it works. Okay, so the uh, pass rates, the global pass rates for the exam, uh, well, you're here, so you've done level one, so congratulations on that. Now, as you can see, the exam pass rates are pretty low, um, and they're, they're, they're better for level two compared to level one, so that's uh, one good thing, okay, so you generally see the light Blue, la blue bar being slightly lower than the dark blue bar. Okay, great. Uh, but still not, not particularly high. Okay, so uh, last year was not bad actually, 52%, but previous years it's been in the mid 40s, quite low 40s. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, that's the passing way. So as you know, um, having done level one, it is a tough exam. Plenty of people uh, fail it the first time. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so we do need to work hard. Okay, so people do uh, do level one in uh, relatively sh short periods of time, um, especially if they've come from financial backgrounds. Uh, potentially, they may have uh, been able to cram it I in two or three months, let's say. I would say level two, uh, you probably need double the amount of time uh, that you spend on level one. Okay, so if you did level one, in two months, if you were one of those very bright people who managed to cram it in two months, I think at least four months for, for level two. Okay, cramming level two is, is a lot harder. Okay, there's a lot of things that appear in level two uh, that you will not have covered even though you may have a, a degree in finance. Okay, so what is the difference between level one and level two? So they do expect you to have uh, remembered your knowledge of level one. So hopefully you haven't thrown away your level one books. Okay, a lot of those uh, things that you studied in level one will come back in level two. Okay, so, but deeper, okay, a greater depth of understanding. Okay, so the, a lot of things that you've you covered in level one, some of the topics, of course, they're going to reappear and then build on that. Okay, in some of the areas um, that we've we started in level one, we kind of stopped halfway and then we're going to carry on in level two. Okay, so. Um, more tricky, more, more, more difficult topics, uh, more complex topics. And as we go through the materials, you'll see some very long examples, and, and that's, the, uh, that's the way that level two, um, the exam will work as well. They'll have much more information that you need to, that you need to take in. Okay, so the other thing to think about for level two is it's just a generally a higher level of competition, of course. Okay, so the people that you're competing against are the people who have already passed level one. Okay, so um, the, the level, the field is, is higher. Estimated that about a third of the people who are doing level two with you, who are sitting in the same exam hall come May 2024, actually a third of them have already done the exam before. Okay, so of course that third have uh, had added time than you if this is the first time that you are studying to do uh, the level two exam, so of course um, that makes them tougher competition as well. So uh, a lot of candidates have spent a, a long, a lot longer than you. Again, if this is your first time approaching level two, the level two exam. 
Okay, so we've talked about the practical skills modules, and uh, and that's the new parts that uh, that, that uh, CFA has has evolved for for the uh, the exams. You'll get some digital badges if you complete. Great. Okay, so just a recap on the CAP plan approach. Okay, so if you sign up to our live courses, which I hope you do, then uh, you will have uh, the education phase, which is nine weeks of going through the core level two materials. Okay, so we will focus, of course, on the important parts to uh, the parts that come up often in the in the exam. And you'll have some progress tests and extra questions that uh, you'll be able uh, to, to do as well, okay, which is important. Okay, because as you said before, uh, the past exams uh, are not available. They will give you uh, limited questions. Okay, so, okay, so that's important. Um, then the revision phase, if you sign up for that, is another four and a half weeks of, uh, of courses. Okay, so uh, there we'll be doing lots of questions, question drilling, debriefing questions. And then the final part is to do a full mock exam. Okay, so you'll do that, you'll do that online, and then you'll come in and uh, I will help uh, debrief that exam. Uh, okay, so that'll be uh, one evening, one Wednesday or Thursday evening, I think, uh, for three hours. Okay, so that is the, uh, the live course that we offer. Okay, so the last part here, we'll do a quick uh, demo lecture on uh, alternatives. Um, just a quick note here is that on each of our uh, slides, in our slide packs, we do uh, describe, uh, we'll, we'll have them easily referenced as to where the materials come from. So if you want to go back to your original, uh, what, the Schweizer books, which I think I'd highly recommend you get, or if you want to go back to the curriculum itself, you can easily do that to, to have a look at where the slide comes from and, uh, and get some more information if you need it. Okay, so a little bit on alternatives and private equity valuation. So, private equity valuation, where does the value come from for, uh, wh why would we bother investing or uh, what does the private in equity industry exist to do? So, um, private equity as opposed to public equity. Okay, so public equity is listed equity, so listed on a, on a stock exchange. Whereas private equity is not listed, okay? So if it's not listed, then uh, we can um, have longer term goals, okay? So we can align the goals better between the owners and, and management, okay? So perhaps we can um, make some of the goals a little bit longer as opposed to public equity where they're more concentrated on, you know, next quarter's earnings. Everything's very short term. Um, Private equity may be able to help bring on expertise, experts, okay? So a lot of private equity firms, they might be specialists in the tech sector or the healthcare sector, so they already have a lot of um, ex-CEOs, um, ex-very senior executives that they can help um, bring in to any, any companies that they, uh, they take on, um, and potentially lower cost debt financing as well. Okay, so on the alignment of economic interests, and I mentioned this already, uh, the managers are able to focus more on the long-term performance versus short-term. Okay, so that's important. Okay, um, you can start to make uh, longer-term strategic uh, decisions as opposed to just thinking short-term, where where uh, you might just be thinking of cutting costs. Um, now, what else? Align the interests of the owners. With the with the managers, okay. So the private equity firm would be the owners or the shareholders, and remember, this is private equity. So, not being listed means that um, it's it you don't need to um, issue uh, an annual report to all your shareholders. Okay, you don't need to uh, do a lot of things that um, public companies do have to do in terms of abiding by the exchange rules. And there can be mechanisms in order to align the interests of your shareholders, uh, who are the owners of the company, with the managers, the management itself. Okay, so the principal agent problem. Okay, what kind of ways can we align these interests? Okay, for example, 
tag-along clause where the management now has exit rights um, if the PE firm sells its stake. Okay, so the PE firm buys this company, brings it private, and then at some point, let's say in five years' time, um, they, they, they IPO the company and make a lot of money. Okay, so if this is the case, then the management team who are working in that company, they're able to get big bonuses. Okay, so that's, of course, going to align the interests of the, the shareholders with the management. Okay, they both get nice payouts, okay, which is something that they may not receive, probably don't receive if they're a publicly listed company. Okay, so compensation can be closely linked to performance. Okay, so these mechanisms can be involved in terms of uh, giving, giving someone a carrot, okay, in terms of giving them big bonuses, or a stick. Okay, they could reduce their pay, uh, reduce their bonuses um, if these targets aren't met. Now, in terms of private equity, we actually have uh, two kinds of, of private equity, really. Okay, the first one is venture capital. And the second one is buyouts. Okay, and they're very different, okay, as we're going to go into in a minute. Okay, so VC is venture capital. Um, this is startup investing. Okay, this is investing in someone's crazy idea. And so this is angel investing. Well, angel investing is very small, but venture capital being uh, is further down that line, but it's still startup investing. Okay, so this is like investing in uh, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, Facebook. You know, after he just got, uh, he just dropped out of Harvard, and uh, and you know, still, just ten people in a, in a small office. Okay, that kind of thing. Whereas, buyouts are very different. Buyouts are leveraged buyouts, LBOs. Okay, so this is where you can take out a company. Again, it's still private. You're bringing it private. Uh, it could be a public company, and then you're making it private by buying the all the shares. Okay, and, uh, and these companies can be very big. Okay, so these are very different types of P, but they're both private equity. Okay, so the first one to look at, let's look at venture capital first. Okay, so startup investing. So as we said, uh, you can see then cash flows unpredictable. Okay, because if it's a startup, then maybe they don't have any cash flows, at least not, none coming in at yet. Um, the product could be based on some new technology, okay? Someone cra someone's crazy idea. Um, maybe this, this, this product doesn't really exist yet. No one really knows that they want it, okay? So this is uh, the kind of thing that you might expect if you are looking at a, a VC investment. Okay, asset base is weak. There is really no assets to speak of. Maybe it is just 10 guys uh, in, a, in a basement somewhere. Hopefully, the management team has a strong entrepreneurial record. Um, there will be uh, little debt at the beginning. Certainly, uh, when, when the venture capitalist comes in, the, the company itself is unlikely to have any debt. Why? Because uh, the banks are not willing to, to lend that company any money because um, they're, ju they're just a startup. Okay? So if you are a venture capitalist, a venture capital firm, looking at making this investment, then uh, it's mostly equity. Okay? You're looking to take um, an equity stake in that company and if the company does well, fantastic, your equity stake goes up and uh, you make a lot of money. But it's very hard to assess the risks. Okay, So risk management, very difficult. Um, of course, a high cash burn rate is to be expected at the beginning because this company may not have um, much of a product yet and you're still developing it. Um, An exit strategy is unpredictable. How are you going to exit? Well, uh, we'll come on to exit strategies in a minute. Okay, which means very few of these companies are actually going to be successful, and that's okay. That's part of the business. That's uh, a part of the business of doing venture capital investing. Okay, so you are, uh, you know that this is. It's likely that nine out of the ten investments that you make as a VC firm uh, will not go particularly well. But from those one out of ten uh, investments that you do make that do very well, then you expect them to make up for all the losses, all the nine losses that uh, that your company has made, and then some. Okay, so these that's uh, that's the sort of distribution of of the investments that a VC firm will make. Okay, so. Uh, and you're going to be making uh, lots of performance fees, hopefully, from that, um, from that successful investment. Okay, contrast that then to buyouts. Okay, so buyouts, cash flows of these companies are going to be very high, stable, and predictable. 
Okay? And the reason for that is these can be very large companies. They can be smaller companies, but they, they, can, be, they can be any size companies, but certainly uh, big companies as well. So the products could be very established, substantial asset base, because this company may have been going on for quite a, a period of time, in which case their team, their management team is, is likely to be quite experienced. Now, this is the reason why cash flows have to be stable and predictable, because buyouts or leveraged buyouts, LBOs, are using a lot of debt. Okay, senior debt, um, junior debt, mezzanine, all kinds of debt. Actually, any debt that they can that they that has a has a market. Okay, they're going to try and load up this company with as much debt as they can. Now, in order for them to do that, they need stable and predictable cash flows. Okay, because again. Um, that's what the debt is going to be based off. So if you were thinking about yourself, if you're going to go to a bank and uh, ask them for a mortgage, now if you have high, stable and predictable cash flows, then they can work off a multiple of that and know that with some certainty that uh, you can pay the interest off on that debt. Okay, so if you are a highly paid lawyer, then great, so these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, salaries you can expects you know a mortgage of x amount something substantial but if you are uh, a crazy entrepreneur who's got a great business plan but but no uh, ca cash flows coming in because the product doesn't exist yet then how much would the bank be willing to to lend them certainly uh, not very much debt okay so so that's the reason why this the target for these buyouts are stable and predictable cash flows Okay, so which means everything is much more predictable. The exit strategy is much more predictable because okay? these companies can be quite mature. They're just cash cows and uh, you've bought them with uh, some of your own money but a lot of debt. Okay, so um, what else can you do then after you've taken over this company? Of course, it's private. Okay, so you're able to um, reorganize that company out of prying eyes. Okay, so perhaps you can uh, make some inroads into cost uh, uh, inefficiencies and, and uh, reduce those. What else? Low variability in success. Okay, so you are quite, quite likely uh, to succeed in most of your buyer investments. Okay, so it is actually quite rare to have those failures. Okay, and what target are we looking for in terms of an investment? Around about 25% IRR or more. Okay, that's the target that, that they're going for. Okay, and they usually get it. Okay, so um, much more predictability. Okay, and again, they will get uh, some nice performance fees um, from those successful investments and from those successful buyout funds. Okay, so valuation issues in private equity. How would I value a company if I am uh, a buyout fund? Okay, now this is straightforward. Okay, because buyout funds are looking at relatively mature companies, can be very large companies. So we could use a discounted cash flow um, model, no problem, and uh, and we do frequently use those models to value our company. What else? We could use relative value, we could use comps, we could use price earnings ratios, um, EBITDA or EBIT ratios, okay, and that's going to back up what we've just done in our DCF model. Whereas, if we're looking at VC, we are targeting startups, some new product. Okay, so what are these cash flows going to be? Well, they're very uncertain, so it's going to be very difficult for us to be used to use a DCF model. What about comps? Well, if it's a new product, then there aren't really any other companies out there in the market already, at least no big ones. Okay, so relative value, looking at other multiples, other trading comps that, uh, that of the companies that, that are in the similar industry can be tricky. Okay, so valuing venture capital is, is actually not, not easy at all. Okay, in terms of debt, how much debt are we going to be using if we're, user, if we're in a buyout fund and we're targeting these companies? Lots of debt. Okay, so... Uh, as we said, that's, uh, that's a key part of how they're going to get their returns. Okay, they're going to use the cash flows of that company to, to pay down the debt. Okay, so they need a high, uh, high amount of debt in the begin to begin with, um, as much as they can really, as the market can absorb. Okay, so whereas we're looking at venture capital, very little debt because uh, the company doesn't have much assets to begin with, not much cash flows as well to back that debt off. So really it's all about e equity investments. 
Then finally, the returns drivers. How do we, um, where do we get the returns from? Okay, if it's a buyout fund, I think really the key here is uh, this one here, the last one, debt reduction. Okay, so with debt reduction, uh, you can see how much debt they've taken on. Uh, they know the cash flows that are coming in that are high, that are stable, that are predictable, as we said. Okay, so every, every year they can use the cash flows of the company to pay down that debt. After five years, that debt's going to be reduced quite a lot. And, um, and then they can, uh, they can sell the company and hopefully make uh, a lot of money. Now, what about their PEs? Okay, so you're going to see the companies are targeting, of course, are going to target um, uh, lower PEs as they can. They want to buy cheaper companies rather than expensive companies. Uh, but this, of course, is going to be very dependent on the market. So if, if they can expand the PE, uh, if they can, if they can uh, time the market, then, of course, they're, they're going to try and do that. But, um, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not easy. If they can grow the, the earnings per share, then, of course, they can try and do that. Of course, they're going to try and reduce uh, operational inefficiencies, as we, as we mentioned. Um, but, again, I think the key is really that third one, that debt reduction. Okay. Key return drivers for venture capital, um, a little bit harder to do the valuation, as we said. Um, and we go into something called a pre-money valuation model in, in the syllabus. Okay, so I'm just going to finish this up now with um, exit routes. Okay, so how uh, and when, uh, which is the best um, exit route for the PE firm? Okay, so the first one, initial public offering seems pretty good. Okay, the pro's highest exit value. Okay, so you invest in, um, in Facebook and Facebook IPOs or Meta, and fantastic, you've probably made uh, a decent return on your money. Okay, so and then what else is great about listing? You know, you are now uh, part or you own uh, this, this company that is listed and this, this listing means that the shares are now very liquid and you can uh, therefore attract and afford to pay uh, higher, higher uh, quality management. Okay, you can afford to give them share options. Fantastic. Okay, the cons. Well, not great cons to be honest, but the, it is more costly to do an IPO. Okay, you need to... You need to get an investment bank, go on a roadshow, uh, go and talk to all your investors. Okay, so this is a long process. It is, it is expensive, okay? But um, if you can do it, I think you would do it. So fantastic. Uh, timing is the key, however. So in certain markets, let's say 2008, in London, there were no IPOs, okay? So it was just that time of the market. No one was um, interested. Everyone was uh, too worried about... Uh, the, the, the global economy. So, you know, if that's the case, then and you really banked on making your money from doing this IPO in that particular year, then I'm sorry. Okay, so of course we are all uh, have to be conscious of the markets. Okay, what else? Second uh, number, second highest uh, exit route would be the secondary market sale. Okay, sale from one firm to another for strategic reasons. Okay, strategic sale. Okay, so what is this? This is this is good because uh, you are selling your company to another for strategic reasons, okay? So in other words, let's say you're an auto company, you've bought this auto company as a PE company, and then five years later you've reorganized it, and you're going to sell it to another P, uh, auto company, meaning there are synergies to be gained. Okay, and if there's synergies to be gained, then that other company can... Uh, buy your company for more, okay? So in other words, they can pay a premium. Okay, so they can pay more. Okay, so this gives you a good valuation actually, okay? So this would be um, one of the uh, good routes to, to, to get some value from your investment. It says here second highest valuation, okay? It kind of depends, okay? So the first one, initial public offering, um, you actually sell shares on a discount. Okay, so you're actually selling shares at a discount, not a premium. Okay, because you are selling to lots of investors. Okay, so there are no synergies to be made if you're doing an IPO. You're selling to lots of individual investors. Okay, so but you're selling at a discount and then you're expecting your shares, once they list, to get a little bit of a bump. Okay, as an IPOs usually do, because that's how they're priced, that's how the bankers price them. Okay, so arguably, number one is not going to give you the highest uh, valuation. Number two is, this will give you the highest valuation. Why? Because 
the trading, the other company can afford to buy you at a premium because they are getting some cost synergies, some revenue, revenue, revenue synergies, etc. Okay, but um, let's say you are uh, Meta or Facebook. Okay, and when they launched, maybe there's just no one else around to be able to take them over. Okay, so if that's the case, then um, then yes, you know, you, the, the IPO would be the, would be a good route to go. Maybe they will do an IPO and then get invite some other company perhaps to take them over. Okay, maybe there's going to be a combination of one and two, perhaps. Okay, but either way, one and two are great results for you as a, as a PE firm. You're probably going to have made uh, a good amount of money. Now, what else? Number three, management buyout. Firm sells uh, to the management. Okay, so this is like another LBO. Okay, so maybe you did a, a buyout and uh, you've been trying to, um, trying to re-engineer the company and then trying to do an IPO or secondary market sale, but for some reason you haven't managed to be able to do that. Okay, so management buyout is you're selling now to the management. Okay, so they're going to do an, another MBO and they're going to use lots of leverage. In other words, uh, you as the initial investor has kind of given up. Okay, so you're probably not going to get such a great um, valuation if you're doing number three because, of course, uh, the new investors who include the management, that's why it's a management buyout, um, they need a certain number, uh, and we said already 25% IRR is the kind of target that they were targeting. Okay, and in order to get that, then, of course, they're not going to be able to by you at such a high level. Okay, so you're probably not going to get such a great valuation if number three is your exit route. Okay, number four is liquidation. Okay, so here firm is no longer viable on ongoing concerns, so just go and uh, close it down. Okay, sell your assets, pay off your debts, and whatever's left um, is what you get as a shareholder. Okay, of course, this is, this is the worst outcome. Okay, so I'm going to leave that here. There's got a few more details about private equity, uh, which you can have a look at, uh, at your own uh, leisure. Otherwise, I will uh, look forward to you guys uh, having any questions. If you have any questions, uh, you can email Kaplan, and I will be happy to take those, take those uh, and reply to those for you. Thank you.